Well, good afternoon, Aggies and friends. You are in the right spot. This is the Engineering Entrepreneurship Mindset Series. My name is Daryl Clue. I'll be your host and moderator of the panel. Um, this is a follow on from uh, when we started the series last semester, but um, had to postpone some stuff because of COVID. But we adjusted like everybody else. We're on Zoom now. <laughs> and um, I actually think the panel format is Zoom friendly. So I think we should be able to have, we should be able to get through this pretty smooth and have some fun. Rearrange some stuff real quick. Um, I'm gonna go through a few housekeeping and then I'm gonna go through some logistics and I'm gonna give a brief overview, a brief introduction about myself so you know why I'm here and what I'm involved with. And then um, we'll get, to the panel. that's what we're really here for is to talk to the panel. Um, we're going, I'm going to ask them a few questions. Hopefully you will ask some questions. We're going to try to make this as interactive as possible. Um, and then we'll rock like that for as long as we can, as long as we're productive. Um, I know the meeting's an hour and a half, but we're going to go as long as we are productive, however long that is. And, and then hopefully at the end, uh, Dean Koga will come in. She had, she had some other things she had to do previously, but she should be arriving uh, soon and then she'll, end us with an address and hopefully we have some fun. So, um, all right, so like I said, I want this to be interactive. We want this to be talking, but not chaotic. So um, I promise you, you won't have to hold your questions long. I'll make sure that I have some specific break points where you can ask your questions um, so that you're not sitting on them. But there's a few ways that you can ask your questions. You can either ask by typing them in the chat, and someone will ask them on your behalf, or you can just type in the chat that you have a question. And um, if you do have a question, uh, we'll probably just drop, uh, get, hand you the mic so that you can ask it just in case there's some follow-up and we can communicate that way. Um, but we do, again, we do want this to be interactive. We're gonna give you some energy. We want you give us that same energy and we hopefully have some fun and learn some things out of this. So. Um, real quick, if there's any questions, this is just the intro, so hopefully there's not too many questions, but um, if no questions, I'll proceed to go through. Cool. All right, so again, my name is Daryl Clue. I am a electrical engineering graduate from uh, a and in uh, fall of 2000, also graduated in 2003 with a master's degree. Um, and when I came out of school in 2000, uh, I did what most people wanted to do at that time. I got a good job. And yeah, um, that was the, the attitude towards for engineers. We're trying to change that so the attitude isn't just get a good job. You can get a job that you can go into research and get another higher degree, but you could also start a company while you're in school or after school. Um, so we're trying to get the energy going to where that is the norm. Um, so, Yes, I got a good job, worked at Motorola for a year. So um, actually designing police radios, uh, designed a lot of the RF front end and some of the audio amplifier circuitry for that. Um, I got some show and tell stuff because I'm at the crib. Uh, some of you youngest might not remember, but we used to have to text and talk on two different devices. So this was the device you text message on and this was the device you talked on. And um, back then, all of the phone screens was really ugly. They were green. And let me try to see if I can turn this one on. This is a 20-year-old phone. But this was a, a dookie green screen like that. And that's when the technology hit me in the face. It looks like a calculator. Um, and it came out with the first colored screen cell phone. It's like an anachronism now. But imagine the first time you saw FaceTime. That's how it looked when you saw the first phone. Um, and that's when I realized that I wanted to be on that team, not the team that was making these. I wanted to be on the, the phone screen team. Um, but they said that I had to have a master's degree to do so. <laughs> uh, so I did. I went back to A&T again and graduated again with a master's of science in electrical engineering. Um, but I didn't go back to Florida. I didn't go back to Motorola. Motorola was dope at that time. Back then, Motorola was like Apple is today or uh, Samsung. It was the, the biggest com, com, uh, telecom com, com company that made devices back then. But I came to DC and like many people in DC, uh, I started uh, contracting to the federal government, uh, worked a little bit at NASA, worked some at the Pentagon, a few other agencies. And that's when I realized again, hit me again, technology did. 
that I had all these ideas that so many companies were making money off of. And I mean, that's the game. The game is the game. You work for somebody, you give them your ideas and they make money. That's how you give them your service, your ideas, and they make money. That's the game. Cool. But um, in 2011, I got up enough gumption to start my own company um, with this, a lot of the same ideas or some growth of those ideas. And um, for about eight years, wound up that company, growing that company. And uh, a few years ago, uh, well, a couple of years ago, I wound up selling that company. Um, got approached by a buyer that wanted to, um, to purchase the company and we made a deal. And a lot of people was asking me, why would you sell your company? Why would you sell your company? And um, I try to keep telling people like, most private companies are designed to sell. Whether you sell it to private equity firm or another company, uh, or you sell it to the public, you go IPO, that's what the initial public offering is. IPO is, you sell it to the, to the public as stock. Um, so selling a company isn't a bad thing. It actually helped me see the entire process of entrepreneurship, the entire circle from startup to struggling to grow, to growing and being successful to eventually um, selling. Um, and what I realized in this process is that that's repeatable. That process of growing, selling, of, of, of starting, growing and selling a company is a repeatable process. And it's done by lots of people. Um, the reason that a lot of people don't do it though is for either two reasons. Um, they don't have the energy or they're not exposed. And one of the things that I wanted to do after I sold my company was to make sure that people at ANT specifically are exposed and have the energy. Whether we gotta poke you with the energy or let, uh, expose you to the energy, but to infuse that energy into the Aggie, pro into the Aggie uh, environment because there's so much talent in the school. There's so much creativity and a lot of your students have the capability to start a company or start or have the ideas to start a company but um, you just haven't been exposed. You don't really know how to get it started. And that's why we started this seminar series, to give you that support, encouragement, and whatever you need to help you get to that place. Um, and um, this instantiation of it is a panel. So that's a little bit about me, why I'm here. I got passionate about this. I want as many um, Aggie students, entrepreneurship energy, and, um, and do what I can to help support that. So uh, a little bit about what we talked about in the previous sessions. Like I said before, there's a few other sessions. Well, first, I'm sorry, if you got any questions. Any questions to me about me real quick? I'm not the focus, but if you have any specific questions real quick about me, I'll answer them. Um, if not, I want to proceed. Cool, you can talk to me at any other time later. Um, I don't want to really focus on me, but I do want to talk about um, there's a question, uh, Mr. Clue. There is one question in the chat. Okay, cool. Come on with it. Um, how did you go up? It's from Edmondson Effort. Okay. How did you go about getting capital to start your company? Good. Good question. We're going to talk about that in a second. I'm actually going through this in a minute um, of capital, uh, uh, um, infrastructure, and everything else. Looks like Mr. Who's that? Edmond? You said Edmond? Whoever? Whoever asked that question, you got some ideas. I love it. Keep that energy. Keep the same energy because I love it. We're going to talk about that idea too. Um, but when you start a company, you have to start it from a concept. And that concept either comes from an act of, 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 of a company of service or a company that you're selling a product. Um, both can be equally profitable. You can make a lot of money either way. Um, but if you have a service, it's typically, it's typically from your expertise. The company that I had um, provided consult consultation services to the government about technology, uh, specifically wireless networks and secure network security. Um, but you don't become an expert immediately. So it takes some time. And that time is, uh, is all that time, the, the, all, the time that you're developing your expertise, you're developing it at another company, which is okay, but it takes time to really develop that expertise because you're gonna need to get a, build a customer base, and you're gonna to say to them, I'm, hey, I'm an expert at, um, I don't know, uh, think of a service. Fixing iPhone, fixing cracked iPhone screens. I'm a, I am an expert at that. Everybody, somebody's gonna walk up to you and be like, I know you can do it better than such and such can do it. So it takes time to develop a customer base. And a lot of times there's contractual relationships that can get bogged down with a bunch of minutia and everything with dealing with contracts. 
Um, so what a lot of people do to show their expertise, they get degrees, PhDs, uh, certifications, licenses. Like I, I also had to get a, a PE to show that I had the expertise. I had to get my professional engineering license, which means I had to take the FE in college and the PE eight hour test that everybody in McNair swears they hates to do, but it could lead to a business one day. So don't shun it too, too hard. Um, um, but yeah, so you start a company doing a service as an expert, it takes you a while to grow that customer base. You're probably going to make less money than when you were working at another company. So you got to be ready and be prepared to not make as much money as others that were at the job that you were at. Um, but that's an avenue. The other avenue I was talking about is if you have a product, and this usually comes from a bright idea, you have a, you're going to make the first um, COVID-proof cell phone case, and it's like you got, you had this dope idea to make this this case, but it cost ten thousand dollars to make the first one, just as a prototype, and you don't know how you're going to do that because you don't have ten thousand dollars yet. Um, that's where it comes into gaining capital, which is a challenge. Um, most of the time people have ideas, but they don't have the capital to get it to actually, to, to move on those. Perfect example. When I was at Motorola and I got, I'm at the crib, so I got all my gadgets with me. I was at Motorola. I developed this circuit. I thought it was the best circuit in the world. This was the first predecessor to, um, I don't know if you can see 20 years old, the first predecessor to what is now wireless speakers using 802.11. Wireless speakers. I, to get that productized or to get a proof of concept of that built, it was like ten, fifteen thousand dollars back then. Um, and I was like, "Yeah, I ain't about to spend no money to just make something like that." Twenty years later, everybody got Sonos, and before you had Sonos, you had the little Apple AirPlay joints. This could have be eventually became that. Sonos worth a billion dollars right now. Apple's worth almost a trillion, more than a trillion now. So again, when you got those ideas to make them, to, to get the fruit and bring them to bear is going to cost a little money is whether you're willing to invest that money or get someone else to help you invest in, the, in, in that product. And then after that, even after you, let's say you got the dope um, um, COVID, COVID free or COVID resistant uh, cell phone screen, a uh, cell phone case. Um, and you get an order for 20 million of them. Now you need more money to do the manufacturing piece. And that's where you get into coming in with more capital investors. And we'll talk more about angel investing and all of that um, later on. Okay, so cool. So now this is all we talked about last time. You got a service as a business or a product as a business. Um, the service as a business, and, and, and both of them can be equally profitable in terms of making money. So I don't want you to think that you can only do, you know, only one is, one is better than the other. But um, finding a service is finding a niche. And a lot of times people are like, I'm a smart person. I can do all these things. People don't pay for all these things. People pay for a niche. Can you come and set up uh, a private network that is only at my house? Oh, oh, here's a good one. Here's a good one. Uh, people used to always go and set up security systems. And then you got companies like Ring. They ship you your box. And you set it up yourself. <laughs> all those people that was developed was setting up security systems. Somebody came along with a bright idea in the product and ring like ring, took them out. Cool. Um, but let's say you are going to service all of the thermometers and you, uh, some, some service thing. Um, it's got to be a niche. You can't just say I do anything electronics related because nobody's going to really hire you about that. Um, but once you find your niche, join all the professional organizations associated with it. Let's say you wanted to, you wanted to install security systems the National Security System Installers of America, get your base that way, get involved with all of the, the things in that industry and, be, and become an authority. That's how you, be, that's how you grow your service. Um, let's say you got a product and let's say you have the, the COVID resistant cell phone case. Great. Um, or, let's, or let's say you have something different. Let's say you, um, let me go like this. This is one thing that, Every senior that graduates from a t is going to do. Every senior at a t is going to create a senior design project. Every, sorry, sorry, every senior engineering major is going to create a senior design project. Now, 
your senior design project could be create the first COVID free cell phone case. You and me, mechanical, mechanical engineer, cool. Uh, maybe chemical, chemical engineer too. Um, but most people look at their senior design project and they say, yo, I'm just doing this to get a grade. I'm trying to graduate, which is okay. Cause you can graduate and get a good job. That's, that's, that's how you, you income fine. But what if you thought about your senior design project as this could be something that I could patent and make it start a company off of. And think about it. Every graduate every year and how big the entrepreneurship space at a t would become. So don't shun your senior design design project. I know you just want to get a grade and graduate, but think about it a little bit harder and think about something that you could create to make money. Um, the energy is going to eventually shift to that and your faculty and everybody will start building on that same energy and hopefully we'll blow up lots of startup and entrepreneurs that come from a and um, That's what we talked about in the previous sessions. And um, we covered that in a lot more time, but, um, and we took a lot of questions and, um, but a lot of people were in, were interested in starting companies, which was great. Um, if you don't want to start a company, I don't want you to check out because even if you work for another company, there's an entrepreneurship, which means that you start your own company and you take on all the risk and you make all the money. But then there's a concept called intrapreneurship when you work for a company, but you got the same energy of an entrepreneur. And I keep telling you that energy is important. So the entire time you are designing radios or cell phones or uh, 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 wireless networks, you're practicing as, a, as an employee of a company because you're building up your skill set, and one day you're gonna get the gumption and step off and do it yourself. So you need that same energy even as an employee because, okay, let's say you don't ever step off. Who do you think gets promoted? The people that are the most innovative and who's gonna make the most money? The people that are bringing in the most business. So entrepreneurship is just, I didn't say just as, but as important as other pieces of working for another company. So entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship, same energy, whether you do it for a company or you do it for yourself. All right, cool. So now we're up to speed of where, where we from, where we started, or where we ended last time. Um, I will take some questions, um, but we're going to get into, we really want to get into the panel. That's why we're all here. But are there any questions now? Um, we did have one. Before you got into the section, um, Ebony Corbett was wondering, how do you promote yourself and your company? So mm -hmm. what I want to do is, you, you did a great job kind of answering that already. So I want to know if you have an extra like specific detail and then if Ebony can respond, if there's something a little bit more specific or if you um, answer that in your last section. Um, depend, it depends. I mean, if you, got a, if you have a service as a product and you're, you know, you're talking about your product, like I said before, um, let's say you are, um, your service is, you are, um, what's a good one? You are sanitizing bowling balls from COVID and bowling ball and bowling alleys. That is your that is your thing. You are the bowling ball sanitizer, so people can bowl without without worrying about catching COVID. Um, you need to get involved with the bowling industries of America, the COVID sanitizers of America. You get involved in all of these trade groups, which automatically creates a network for you. And then once you get into that network, then it's the marketing comes from that. It's not you with a bunch of flyers going at both. Well, I mean, it is, but it's not directly. Because if you imagine going to a bowling alley and saying, hey, I, I disinfect bowling balls. And be like, yeah, so we, I got, I got a lot of people can do that. You need to get your, 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 your bona fides, they call it, first. Uh, well, as you're trying to grow your company. I don't know if that answers your question, Ebony, but if you have a follow-up, um, let us know. Hi. Yes, I do. Hey. Um, so when you say, like, creating that network mm -hmm. did you did you create a target audience first mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and how do you go about doing that yep um, per se? so good question in, in my specific case uh my since i started as an entrepreneur working for another company my customer base was the customer base of the company that i worked for um so i was already kind of shooed into the to, to the network of having a customer base. If you don't have that access to that, that's when it gets really hard 
Because like I said, it takes a long time to develop a customer base off of a niche when you have to convince people that you're the expert at doing it. Um, that's the challenge. That's going to take a lot of time too. Is there, um, do you have a specific niche right now, Ebony, that you want to think about marketing or, I mean, cause yeah, there's marketing and social media marketing, but I'm talking about really convincing people to give you money to do something. Yeah. Um, I, I sell hair care products that are vegan. Nice. Um, and so, um, I really want to like, uh, work on that target audience and really creating that network, but I'm not sure how to do that yep. right at the moment. So first thing you want to do is you want to get in the, in the vegans are us group and get yourself surrounded by all of the vegans that you can find. Then you want to get involved with all of the people that do hair and, 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 Surround yourself with as many people like that as you can find. Because remember, you're not, it's harder to just go and just find customers. You got to find the network first. Well, I didn't say first, but you a lot of times have to find the network that find that has all the customers. Because imagine if you if you met a thousand vegans, somebody gonna need some hair. And imagine if you met a thousand people who wanted hair, somebody's gonna be vegan. And that's when the intersection happens at that point. Cool. Yes, that helps a lot. Thank you so much. Okay, no problem. Um, any more questions? Thank you, Ebony. Um, any more questions? Because we're going to get into this panel real quick. That's cool. We have a question from Mr. Effort about um, intellectual property protection. Uh, yeah. Is that something uh, one of our panelists can speak to? Yeah, we're going we're gonna to talk. So, IP, we... In this series, we had um, the introduction that kind of went through a, a condensed version of introduction. We're going to do this panel today, which we'll talk a little bit about IP rights. But we're going to have an entire session with an IP lawyer straight from the, uh, the, the um, U.S. Patent Office, an IP lawyer, and a person who does IP rights in industry. Um, do you have a specific question about IP? Because if you have a specific question, I could try to answer it now, but the topic of IP is, is, is large. Actually, yes, I do. In yes. particular, if you had, if you're trying to solicit uh, uh, capital or funding from investors, how, is imp how important is it that you have uh, intellectual property on a potential product that you are trying to bring to market? Yep, um, there's levels to um, licensing and patents and, 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 and copyrights. Um, at minimum, you want what's called an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement. Um, we, we have, well, you have one for pretty much all conversations when you're talking about uh, selling companies or, or selling a product. Um, if you don't have it patented yet, because it take, the patent process takes a long time, but you have something that's in the, pro the patent process, the patent review process, at least start with an NDA. And a non-disclosure agreement basically says, look, I'm gonna expose my ideas to you and you have to sign this sheet, this legal document saying that once you hear this idea, you can never do anything with it. Um, the only protect, the, the, you're protected by the NDA legally at that point, but what you're not protected from is if somebody else comes up with the idea and that's what the patent process is for, the patent review process. But I should say this first, if you, before you start talking to people about your idea, sign an NDA, get them an NDA. An NDA non-disclosure agreement is a few pages and they got some boilerplate ones, but if you, you can talk about attorneys and stuff, but NDA is pretty simple to, to draft up. Cool. All right. Good. Um, Thank you. Any, no problem, man. Any, any more questions? We're going to get into this panel. I want them to talk because they got some cool stories. I'm just a guy. Um, all right. Good. Jumping into the panel. Great. So now we got, I'm telling you, we got some folks on this panel. We're going to start off with the, we're going to start off with the, all right, cool. We're going to start off with the OG. So Jim Garrett, um, he is <laughs> probably the, he is the most successful entrepreneur on this panel and on this call, probably. Um, I'm going to let Jim introduce himself, but there's a, there's a quick little point, data point that I want to give you about Jim. Um, Jim is the embodiment of, or, or this story is the embodiment of Aggies do and Aggies give and giving back 
with the semblance of that and how that helps the whole cycle of a and uh, Jim, he'll tell you about his company, but uh, Jim, when he was you know, as a successful entrepreneur, developed the Jim Garrett Scholarship. Um, like a lot of, you know, three people say, I even have a Daryl Clue Scholarship. Awesome. Jim's scholarship went to another panelist 10 years ago that didn't know Jim. So you got Jim Garrett scholarship received by another panelist. His name is, he's on here too, Raheem. Raheem gets the Jim Garrett scholarship. And 10 years later, Raheem and Jim are on the same panel and they've never met each other, mostly because of COVID, but they've never met each other. So you got two people, you got Jim giving back to a t which another young Aggie is able to get that scholarship and become a successful entrepreneur. And now him and Jim are on the same panel. This is the, seg- the circle of Aggies do right here in the same spot. And so I'm telling you, true OG, Jim, I'm going to let you introduce yourself and tell your story. Um, give us a few minutes of your time telling your story. Thanks, Jim. Okay, thank you, uh, Daryl. And uh, so glad to uh, see all of you and uh, talk to all of you uh, aspiring entrepreneurs and uh, aspiring uh, uh, entrepreneur graduates of North Carolina a and I graduated from North Carolina a and uh, a long time ago before many of you were even thought of, and that's during the civil rights era. And uh, my freshman class, uh, uh, those four fellows, we were all in the, that uh, did the sit-ins downtown, we were all in the same class. And, and two of them are my personal friends, and, and uh, so, and if you go over there and look on the monument, you'll see my name on the uh, Greensboro Four monument as I was headed up the campaign to uh, actually uh, build that uh, monument. But I uh, started, uh, I graduated from a in 1964 in electrical engineering. And I then went into the army as an army officer out of ROTC. And then I went in the Army in the Signal Corps, and the Signal Corps is all about communications, electronics, radar systems, and so forth. And then I was assigned to a Lexington Army Depot in Lexington, Kentucky. And the big part of that is that I went out to uh, Lexington, Kentucky uh, in this age of segregation. And when I got there, and they had 3,000 civilians, and they had 20 military, it was only black. They're supposed to find me housing. They didn't know how to find that. So they put me in the YMCA uh, and I had to stay in the YMCA for two months. At the same time, during the night, in the evening, I'm really co- completely aware that I'm a black guy out here. They can't find housing for me in this segregated era. But when I go to work on the next day, I'm in charge. I'm 23 years old and I'm in charge of 15 engineers, all white, and I'm uh, an officer in charge. So that's kind of a path, uh, you know, that ROTC kind of gives you to leadership. Then I went to Vietnam and we would, in Vietnam, we were installing uh, troper scatter antennas up and down the uh, coast of South uh, Vietnam and, and up to North Vietnam. And so we had communications all over the, uh, the area to communicate uh, and so forth. Then I went to left the army and I went to work for the Navy. I was only in the army for two years. Back then you only had to do two years. I went to work for the Navy and I went to the Navy uh, as an engineer of the Naval uh, Sea Systems Command and Naval Electronic Systems Command. I was designing antennas and antenna networks for US Navy ships. And Back then you had, you had the antennas, you had the multi-couplers and transmitters and receivers and all that. And you put all that together and then you install it on the ship. But the big part about a ship is that uh, you have uh, some of ships like the largest aircraft carrier that planes land and, and, and forth on that ship and take off. Uh, you can have a, up to a hundred emitters and sensors on one ship. When you talk about uh, navigation systems, uh, uh, satellite systems, uh, fire control, missile directors, uh, communication systems, electronic war warfare systems, all these antennas and so forth, they all are competing and they all want omnidirectional coverage. But the problem is they, they, they don't suppose to occupy the same frequencies, but they do actually, uh, there's spillover, there's uh, intermodulation interference products that the, even the uh, cables along the, the ship 
uh, create rusty bolts and that becomes a small transmitter and that creates electromagnetic interference. And so ultimately I became the person in charge of electromagnetic interference and topside design for all U.S. Navy ships. In other words, I'm, I was the guy in the Navy working as a civilian and I became at the top of that food chain uh, for electromagnetics. And the thing about it that uh, this, the subject that I hated the most in college was electromagnetic magnetic wave theory. And one of the reasons I went into that is because, I mean, I wasn't that good at it. I mean, I wasn't like the, the, the top person, uh, an expert and a genius and anything like that. But I did understand and I appreciated knowledge. And so I knew that if I got into electromagnetic interference that I could understand that, then I'm gonna set myself apart. And so I began to get more and more in that and ultimately they used to call me Mr. EMI, Mr. Electromagnetic Interference. And so at some point, uh, I, I, then I had lab, government laboratories and I had government contractors working for me. And I had about three or four different laboratories. I had a, back then I had a budget of about $50 million. Today, that would be a probably a budget of people like that have four or $500 million budgets that they do stuff with. But anyway, um, so I have these eight different contractors with me doing testing, they doing uh, laboratory uh, work, and they also going out on ships and, and then I see these people doing contractors, and it came along when uh, Rick, when Nixon came along, he started, he started black capitalism, and that ultimately went into what they call the 8 a program, where they wanted to have special privileges for uh, minority companies, really black companies, doing business with the government. And so this went on for a while, and I saw all these people doing uh, business with the government. And what I noticed was that a lot of the uh, contractors and some of the small businesses, they call themselves uh, contractors. And so when you ask them, what did they do? They say they do contracting with the federal government. So they would say, it's kind of like, it reminded me when I was growing up and I saw uh, a lot of black people in doing labor work and, and they would say, what do you do? They said, whatever you've got, I'll do it. In other words, you do whatever people want you to do. And so, I would see people kind of approaching it like that, that I'm in the government contracting business. And so do you have a contract for me? And so just like uh, Daryl was saying, is first of all, you have to understand what people need and what problems you can solve. And so I decided that I would leave the government and start my own company doing electromagnetic interference products and so forth. And the big product that uh, I worked on uh, and we developed software for is a software that solves uh, electromagnetic interference and spectrum management between Navy ships. Now there's inter-ship interference where systems on the ship interfere with, with each other. But if you know anything about the Navy, uh, when you send the Navy and they go out on a task force, you have about 20 ships. And these ships are located, they are like uh, five miles apart. And so it could be 20 miles, uh, 20 ships or whatever, and they got these, so it could be 100 miles in different parts of them, they're, they're apart. But uh, what happens then if an enemy missile is going to be coming toward a ship, the radar picks up this missile coming in. And then you have a smaller radar that's more uh, focused that illuminates that radar coming in. And the energy off of that emission is reflected back. But that energy is reflected back. Then you have a missile that's launched that's tuned to that same frequency of the emitted energy and it intercepts it. And once it locks on to that uh, same energy interference, that's, that frequency, then the, it's going to hit that missile. Problem. You may have another ship 
that's in this force that also is looking at that same target. And so if that shift then it also illuminates the missile, the missile that comes off of the ship that you fire could be captured and hit your own ship. So then, so you have to deconflict these systems by frequency management and solving software, having software that understands the electromagnetic and spectrum characteristics of all of the emitters and sensors on the ship, especially the radar systems. And so then you have to develop a program that channels all that energy away. Now, when we were doing this uh, early on, you know, we had big reels of tapes that you send out. And ultimately, we came to the point where you had, you know, computer disks that you were sent to the ship. And of course, uh, even today, I consult with my company that I, that I sold. I sold my company, but I consult with them. And the contract that I started, that I got in 1991, uh, I'm working with them on that today. They got this contract 30 years ago, almost. And I'm working with them now. And what am I working on with them? They don't need me to design anything anymore. But as Daryl was saying, I have the relationship with those customers. When, when I was uh, early on, some of those customers that were in their 20s and 30s, they are now in charge. And I know them. And so when I see them, they're so happy to see me. But the company is saying, we need you, me, to just relate to them, talk to them. And even now I sit here home and I, I call them up and I, uh, we have these Zoom meetings and so forth and we talk. So, and so Jim, that, how, yeah. long, how long was it from, basically, basically you did a very long entrepreneurship <laughs> yeah. before you, you know, as you was you know, working as a civilian for the government, before you even started your company. How long was that? 15 years. So 15 years. So, so again, y'all, so what I'm trying to show you is that, yes, you could come out and start your own company, or you might even have to take 15 years like Jim. I took another 10 years. Um, we've got somebody else on the panel that's a, done it even shorter than that. Um, I want to bring in Raheem. Raheem will get you in a second. But remember now, Jim and all of his uh, commercial success and, and business success led to a scholarship that Raheem got. And Raheem, tell us, tell us a little bit about your story. Give us a few minutes and tell us your story, please. All right, cool. Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a recipient of the James Garrett Scholarship. I uh, received it back in 2007. Um, and I just want to first, first, before everything, I want to formally thank James Garrett for, you know, what he's done and his funding. And, you know, at, at a, as, as a college student at 18, you don't realize, you know, the impact of you know, having, having financial aid and student loans and how that's going to affect you in the future. And I feel like, you know, um, this goes to show you that, you know, great things can happen when you give back to the right place and, you know, a t is the right place. So I just want to give a virtual clap to James Garrett. <laughs> 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 Aggies do. <laughs> yep, definitely. Um, yeah, so I'm, uh, so I went to a t as an electrical engineering major. Um, and from throughout, throughout that experience, I was able to get four internships with General Electric and two of those internships was actually for quality assurance. So I began my career as a quality insurance uh, QA tester. I just, I was testing um, some, some meters for like a, a, a digital meter company, like the meters that go on the side of the house. I was testing like a Windows mobile application where really it wasn't a challenging job. I was just pressing buttons saying if this passed or failed. Um, so at that point, it wasn't really challenging for me. So I wanted to do something that I can utilize my engineering skills and abilities to, you know, be creative. So I decided to transition into embedded systems development. Um, so I went on to a company where I developed the, uh, I did avionics software development for private business jets, the company out of Switzerland called Pilatus, where I was in charge of developing the embedded systems for the pilot controls. Um, Eventually, that became boring as well. Just looking at computer screens all day, um, literally was a black screen, writing code. Um, I knew there was a jet I was never going to fly in. I didn't really have interest in it. It was really just for me to build my fundamentals. Um, so that, that job really was just like, a, you know, me getting basic programming fundamentals to eventually lead on to something else. Um, so one day, I actually spoke to my brother, Daryl, 
Um, and he was like, hey, man. <laughs> he was like, hey, man, um, you know, we were trying to figure out, you know, the next, the next move um, in my career. Um, but I, I really had no idea. I just knew I wanted to do something innovative. Um, and like everybody else, I went online. I Googled how to make a, how to make a million dollars. <laughs> Um, and then that led me to, you know, different careers, like how to, you know, what, what are the top paying careers? So I was just doing research just to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, I came across, you know, app development. Um, it was something I've always had an interest in, but I never really, you know, had the motivation to do it. Um, so one day, one of my friends actually had an app idea um, and he ended up getting his app developed in somewhere in China for, for a cheap price. And it came back looking trash and, um, you know, for... <laughs> For me, I was just like, you know, it, it kind of sparked my interest. You know, when I saw that the app, you know, wasn't up to par, I figured, I figured that, you know, maybe there's a way I can make it better. Um, so that led me into doing my own research and, you know, trying to figure out ways I can learn app development. So I was a self-taught developer. Um, I went on YouTube. I watched YouTube videos on how to develop apps. Um, I got books off from Amazon. Um, I've even took like online courses, um, MI MIT at the time had an online course. They posted lectures online. So ended up getting a free course from MIT. Um, six months later after that, I ended up getting my first job at a startup company to develop apps for them. Um, so from there, I've worked with big fortune 500, fortune 500 companies such as Southwest airlines, um, Cox media group. Uh, Verizon, Florida Power and Light, Nextera Energy, um, and some more. Um, and during that experience, I was able to build up some expertise and enhance my skills. And that led me into starting my own app development company called Appovation. And I'll get into some more details about that later. Nice, nice, nice. Good, 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 good. Um, I'm going to take a quick second to break and ask if there are any questions for either Jim or Raheem or myself. Um, we're going to get to our next panelist in a second, but I wanted to, wanted to open the floor up for any questions. We got Jim, OG, biggest company that probably is on his team, you know what I'm saying? Um, a lot of EMI stuff, a lot of major things he's done. And you got Raheem, the shipping concept, but also a um, little, little closer to your age, but he's also done some entrepreneurship stuff, and now he's an app developer with his own company. Um, any questions for either one of them right now? I'll have some questions for them later but I wanted to open the floor up. All right, no problem, cool. We'll get to our third, uh, third panelist, not final, but third panelist, uh, Carl. Carl, can you, um, he's also an Aggie graduate too, can you uh, give us a few minutes about um, your career? Yep, thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm an Aggie, uh, originally from DC. Uh, got to ENT in, in 1988, uh, did three degrees there. Um, Started there sort of doing work uh, sort of in double E, but my focus is really on basically AI and machine learning. Um, and, you know, I, I published my first paper as an undergrad in uh, basically machine learning, looking at genetic algorithms to uh, compose music. Today we call that sort of generative algorithms. Uh, back then it was just a cool project. Uh, sort of like Jim, uh, I, I found my, myself uh, going to the Navy. I was a civilian engineer uh, where I worked for Naval Undersea Warfare Center. <clears throat> so while Jim was uh, on the surface, uh, I was dealing with uh, things that was under the surface, which is pretty cool. So I, I actually uh, did a lot of development uh, on their combat systems. I created the, the first uh, windowing environment for the combat systems. Um, and I developed a bunch of expert systems and other sort of uh, machine learning types of tools while I was there at the Naval Undersea Warfare Center. I uh, was able to keep my job and go back and get uh, uh, a PhD back at a and double E. Uh, there I started uh, focused on uh, face recognition uh, and computer vision. So I finished that degree from uh, 95 to uh, 99 and uh, when I left, I had this really cool face recognition system that I thought was the best thing since sliced bread, much better than the current technology that was out at the time, but it was uh, very compute intensive. I uh, took a job uh, with a company called Corning Optical Fiber and developed a bunch of computer vision solutions for them. 
and then decided that uh, in 2002, I wanted to sort of uh, go back into academe. When I went back into academe, um, you know, as a professor, you have to have a research. Uh, and so I dusted off my dissertation and uh, I took uh, basically a couple sentences uh, for my dissertation and I started a research program in 2003. That research program um, has brought a, a lot of acclaim to me uh, and set me sort of up to create uh, a startup company. Actually, I had three startups, uh, but the one that I'm focused on now. And that's all around sort of, uh, uh, you know, base. So I developed um, uh, uh, solutions for improving face recognition. In 2003, that was you know a couple of years after 9/11. Uh, uh, face recognition was really huge, but there were a lot of uh, holes in our on our current technology. So I worked for uh, NSA, CIA, and FBI to develop uh, some of their key technologies for face recognition. And that basically, uh, I was able to leverage that, uh, created a couple patents, and uh, in 2015, I leveraged that to spin out a company that's doing what I call the next generation of computer vision for faces. And that is basically extracting uh, health and wellness information from the face. So we can look at your face and determine uh, chronic disease states uh, and other, uh, other attributes of the face. So I'll stop there. I see there's some questions about the patent process uh, mm -hmm. and IP. Happy to talk about that as well. Good. Thanks, Carl. Okay, uh, everybody, we've got all three panelists here, um, including myself. You can, I guess, you can look at me as a panelist, but you've got me, uh, a company as a service that, that provides a service. You've got Jim, company that provides some service and hardware. You've got Raheem that provides a product, which is apps. And then you got Carl. He's got a, a bunch of different things. Which, I mean, so you got kind of like the entire spectrum of Aggie engineering, especially in electro electrical engineering stuff. Um, I see there's some questions. I'm gonna start asking them from the audience and then I'll get to my questions for the, for the panel in a second. So uh, Jim, um, the, so let's talk about, let me get the first one. Um, isn't it better to grow a company than to sell it? Do you regret selling your company? Well, uh, I don't regret selling the company. It's, it's, it's kind of like when you, uh, uh, in other words, I was rewarded for selling the company and it's kind of a culmination. And like you said, uh, there is a cycle of a company, especially if you're small, uh, you can grow the company and you can, you know, just keep it forever or you can sell the company and reap the benefits of what you have done. And uh, so I, I don't regret selling the company, but I do miss, you know, the people and being, uh, you know, uh, in, in the network of all that. So that's why I continue to stay active and, uh, you know, even with, uh, with a and with, uh, with other companies and so forth. So, the answer is I don't regret uh, selling the company. Um, the for for uh, to add on to that, I know we make it look we don't. So let me just say it this way: running a company is hard, and it's a lot of work, and it's a lot of effort. Saying you want to keep a company forever and run a company forever it takes an extraordinary amount of effort, and everybody's at a price. Typically, most people get to their price and they either IPO where they sell it to the to, to the public, or they sell. It, and if you have a really well a really well run company, someone will come and buy it. That doesn't mean you can't start another company. But when all of your effort and energy is involved and invested into this one thing, and most companies have a cycle, and if that thing goes away, all of the wealth and energy that you put into it goes away as well. A lot of people sell out not only just to cash out and get paid, but so they can divorce themselves from all of the risks that you have in running this company. And I keep talking about the energy. The difference between a lot of times just people who are employees for 40 years and people who start their own company is the energy. It takes a lot of energy to become an entrepreneur. Um, 
So cool. Thanks, Jim. Um, there's one more question for you too, Jim. Um, Edmondson asked this one as too as well. It says, uh, did your company first spend time doing hardware development and shift to software, or were there something you developed were they something you developed simultaneously? Software and hardware. We we developed uh, software and services. Uh, some sometimes you, you consider that uh, you know a, a product for software I mean is a product, but we also but we also kind of considered that as you know a combination of of a product and a service. But uh, mm -hmm. what I what I thought once we started to uh, do well and knowing that engineers like to be challenged, I set up. Uh, something that we would have uh, individual or different people, if they were interested in research, that they would uh, focus on a research of a product. And so, and then if they really made that proposal, then we would fund that. And so, and because we had a lot of the software developers, so what one of the products that we developed was a chemical and biological agent detection system, which seems like a stretch, but because we had the software engineers and we also had a biologist working there with them that has some experience in that. So we mixed all that together. So the same engineers that are working on spectrum management and electromagnetic interference also were instrumental in developing this uh, chemical and biological agent detection system, which is a system of systems that they have it installed around campuses uh, to detect whether or not uh, you know, you're being attacked you know, for the military. Cool. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and say it right now. Even if you develop only hardware, every piece of hardware uses some software. <laughs> so unless you're building a hammer, you gonna need some software developed. And so most hardware companies also have software engineers as well. So um, you might have a, 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 an idea for a gadget, but Unless that gadget is, well, if that gadget is a rock, okay, cool, you don't need any software, but if your gadget is anything electronic, it's gonna need some software involved in it. So, um, good question. I appreciate your question, Evanson. Um, um, got one question for you, uh, Carl. So, have you been through the patent process and the IP registration? Yeah, <clears throat> I, have, uh, I have two patents um, currently, and actually, uh, I, I, um, I did the patents with the university and um, when I started the company, we licensed the patents uh, out from the university. So that was a, that was part of the process. Um, the patent you process. That, you think license the patents out, would explain that a little bit. Yeah, so uh, when I decided to create this, this company with my co-founder, um, we wanted to have some level of intellectual property as a protection mechanism, as that sort of intellectual moat. Um, and so um, when we created the company, we went to the university and we said, we will license this technology from you. The technology happens to be sort of algorithms as well as some source code. Mm -hmm. From that, we, we expanded and built upon that to create uh, even more intellectual property. One of the things we could have done was to go and continue that patent process. It's expensive uh, to develop a patent. Uh, cheap uh, is probably about 10 or 15K per patent, depending on it, um, but it could be very expensive. And then you have the defense of the patent that you have to worry about too. So there are costs uh, every sort of two years that you have to go through uh, for that. So we chose on the company side to do what we call trade secrets. So we have very unique IP that we know how to do that others don't. We don't put it out there in the public sphere through a patent because we would be teaching them, giving them a leg up uh, on how we do our process. So we didn't want to do that. We kept that as a trade secret. Got it. Cool. Um, there were some questions about patent stuff that I wanted to make sure people understood. It, it sounds in a sentence all you got to do is get a patent, but that process can be years long. Most of the time is years long and tens of thousands of dollars. And let's just say you do get a patent. Let's say I get a patent for, um, uh, let me think of something for, I can patent black AirPods. So I got a patent for black AirPods. 
I think I got that patent down and then Apple comes and sells black AirPods and they sell a billion of them and I only sold 15. I got to now challenge Apple and use all of my money to pay for lawyers because Apple stole my patent. There's a lot of times that people get patents or steal patents just because they know you ain't got enough lawyers, you ain't got enough money to spend on the lawyers. So I don't want to think, I don't want people to think that all you got to do is get a patent because that is a, and it can be an arbitrage of, 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 of money and time spent. So um, it's good that it's good to hear that you can you explain the trade secret as well. Um, but um, cool. So are there any more questions for the panelists? I got a few too. If you don't want to, if you don't, anybody want to ask their own question, floor is open. We have a question. Cool. Um, so for Carl, big companies are coming up with free better algorithm in the field of computer vision. How do you compete with this big company? Thank you for your question. Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. Um, so in, in today's world of AI ML, um, what's more important than the algorithms for the machine learning or the AI is the data around it. And so uh, we have a very specific type of data that's not easy to come by. So not only do we have face data, but we have uh, other attributes that marry to that face data that allows us to create our algorithms and protects us with a data moat from even the big players. Um, and, you know, recently uh, we, we've had uh, a couple big players, uh, you know, try to get in our domain. What they find is that um, there is a, a bit of a challenge in solving the type of problem that we're solving. Not that they couldn't solve it. They tried to solve it pretty quickly uh, and inexpensively. So inexpensively is, you know, they, they threw a bunch of data scientists, AI engineers, and some data at it for about a year at a cost of about a half a million dollars. Uh, and they weren't successful, so they walked away. Well, you know, we've been doing this. I've been working in this space for, you know, the better part of 20 years. Uh, so we had a leg up on them with regards to the data and uh, how to tune the algorithms to uh, extract the most out of it. So right now we have a great moat. Uh, can that moat be overcome by dollars? Absolutely it can. But for the moment, we're, we're safe. Cool. Um, Ryan, got a question from you from the chat. Um, uh, how do you decide on whether the scope, on whether the scope of a customer wants is within the capabilities of your company? Somebody comes to you with an app, Ryan, and they say they want to solve nuclear fusion. <laughs> <laughs> no, but for serious, okay. how do you how do you figure out? What okay, yeah. Hey, can you hear me? I can't hear you, Daryl. Okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry. So you said. You said, how do I figure out the scope of a, of, a pro of a project? How do you decide on whether the scope of what a customer wants is within the capabilities of your team and your company? Okay, cool. So, so one thing I do is I, I specify what I do like specifically. I focus on iOS apps, Android apps, and web apps, um, and maybe even some, uh, some desktop applications. So there's, there's nothing that I don't feel comfortable with taking on in that, in that space, but anything out of that, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make a, you know, nuclear, a nuclear fusion app or like try to do some, some artificial intelligence, like, mm -hmm. like cars company, for example. Um, so, you know, I, I, I kind of stay in my, fit, my, my space and my level of expertise. Yeah. Um, but in terms of that, you know, if somebody came to me and said, I want to make the next Snapchat or Instagram, I'll definitely take on a product, you know, I mean, it's, it might cost more money, but that's something that we have to talk about when we're discussing the requirements. Another thing, uh, Daryl, if I could jump in, another thing that you guys got to think about is your network. So Rahim has a project that has some AI dealing with face. They want to take on Snapchat. Well, you know, you have people like me who are fellow Aggies who develop all that landmark technology that actually Snapchat <laughs> uses today. I wish like hell I would have thought about of doing what they're doing. That was a gimmicky, you know, idea. And me as a real researcher, never even thought about it. And uh, I am quite dumb <laughs> in retrospect. Yeah, um, if, if uh, one of the things I, I, I hope you're seeing um, from the panel is that 
everybody found a niche. Nobody is on this panel talking about they do everything. Um, you find your niche and you pull that thread as long as you can. Um, that's what makes you special. That's why that's how you can iterate and, and, and cogitate in one space and grow as far as you can. Um, if I mean, I hate to make bad examples, but if I was a consultant and I said that I can consult from anything from um, wireless networks to um, I don't know, sous chefs. <laughs> it's like you got to find your lane and stay in it. And it's in the narrower you make your niche, the more valuable you'll be because you can, um, at least starting out, you can build in that space and grow that space. Like if, um, I mean, big companies, they start to diversify when they get big, but um, companies typically start in a very small area and they grow in that area first. Cool. All right. So any more questions? I will start asking some of mine. Um, I'll give you a few minutes if you've got any questions, anybody, for anybody on the panel. Um, we have a question from Dean Coger. Cool. Hey. Uh, from, for the whole panel, please talk a bit about the advice you would give others seeking to start their own companies uh, on the topic of the people that you hire and making sure they are the right fit. Good. Thank you for the question. Thanks. Jim, can you start with that since you probably have hired the most people? <laughs> well, we had uh, 350 uh, engineers and uh, computer scientists. And uh, one of the things that helped me... Time, Jim. I don't think everybody understands how big it is. One more time. How many people? 350. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which, you know, it, it, it's relative. You know, it's some, in some circles that's small. Uh, if you think about Boeing and Lockheed, who has, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. So this circle, that's big, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the, um, I, I, what, what was the question again? This, about, yeah, advice about giving. Um, oh, you oh, yeah, the advice. The advice. Uh, the, the, the thing uh, that, uh, when the big thing that helped me uh, toward the middle time was, was the Jim to uh, Jim Collins good to great, mm -hmm. and uh, that's a classic. It was written around two thousand. Uh, ah, let me get back here. You mean this book? Yes, that's <laughs> it right there. But basically, what it says is is that you have to find the the basic premise is you have to get the right people on the bus, and the wrong people off the bus, and so. Uh, my advice really is that uh, the people, especially when you're starting out, uh, you need to make sure that the people that you're starting out with want to go where you want to go. If, and they, they need to know exactly, you know, as if it's a niche area or if they just want to go in business, that's one thing, but they want to go in the business that you're in. And also as you begin to build your team, uh, you have to make sure that you're getting people that have the chemistry and compatibility with you. And I actually started out, uh, there were three of us that, that started, and one person, uh, you know, we had to, just, you know, after three or four years, we had to kind of buy him out uh, because uh, he, he just wasn't a fit for what we wanted to do. And so those are the hard decisions that you have to make. And so, but it's just like a marriage. Mm. You have to find the right person and the right team. And it's built, it's, it's like a football team or a sports team. Those are good analogies. Whatever you're doing, you got to find the right people. And, if, and you have to make the hard decisions uh, to move away from the people. I had friends that, you know, said, okay, let's start a business, let's start a business. And we said, okay, we're going to meet on Friday. Well, Friday they were doing something else. They forgot all about it. So that's not the right person. But anyway, that's one thing I would say. Uh, make sure you have the right people around you in whatever you're doing. Cool. Raheem, I know you, um, I know you employ a few other people to help you make some of these apps. Yeah. How do you choose? Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. So I guess piggybacking on what on what on what Jim said, um, my one of my first words of advice would be like only to pursue something if you have a passion for it, because people don't understand that doing this 
start your own business, it's going to take a lot of hours, a lot of, you have to stay motivated. So you have to do a lot of stuff that sometimes you don't want to do. Um, so it helps to have a passion about something before you do it. I've started other businesses, you know, selling watches, selling bags and stuff. I didn't have a passion for it. I was doing it just for money. Um, so if you have a passion for something, you know, it allows you to be that much more motivated, determined and focused on, you know, meeting that end goal. Um, cool. In terms of, in terms of hiring, um, I would say right now I'm, I'm, I'm at a lean startup, like cost effective phase to where it doesn't cost me money to run my business unless I get a contract. Right. So right now I don't have any overhead costs. Um, I don't have to pay out my developers unless I get a client who wants an app done. And then that's when I hire my, my team and, you know, I get developers like that. Um, mm -hmm. But for me, um, it helps since I'm a developer myself, since I can actually develop the app myself, you know, I've, I've had years of experience of doing this already. So I can look at, you know, different developers code or kind of talk to tech talk with other developers overseas as well to um, kind of get an idea of their experience and level of expertise. So that's how I go about, you know, hiring. Cool. Carl, I know you started with some, some um, um, co-owners as well. And, and so I know you had some partnerships. Now, any issues or anything you want to, to speak about? Some, some of the lessons learned from that? Yeah. Um, I, I just like to start off by saying that uh, there are three elements that you have to think about when you are uh, deciding to go in business or to hire someone and to work with them. The first one is trust. You have to be able to trust them uh, fully. The other one is fit. Um, you have to have a social and cultural fit with them. And the third is work ethic. You guys have to be aligned around work ethic. If you have those three things together, then, you know, uh, it, it helps you to get along and to uh, prosper. It's, there's no guarantee of success, though. Yeah. Cool. Um, there's another, there's a topic that we've talked about before, but I want to bring it up again because it's a common theme and it's entrepreneurship. Um, while yes, this is about entrepreneurship, but entrepreneurship is also a part of entrepreneurship. And it's a theme that you've heard from Jim. He basically did a 15 year entrepreneurship. He worked for 15 years learning his craft while working for some for another company and then started his own company and grew up to 350 people. I don't know if you know, if you can imagine how big that is as a company, but um, myself, I worked for another company for a decade multiple companies for a decade before starting my own company. But every day that I was going to work, I was using it as I still had the entrepreneurship energy. It was just a matter of time before I would start my own company. You see, Raheem, develop apps for companies, for a company, working for a company, developing an app until he realized, no, I'm going to do this myself and develop my own apps as a company. So um, Carl, you see Carl, took, took some of his research, you know, took that and went on to use it as a company. So it's rare that people have a flash in the pan or a bright idea and they started from that and that's it. You t a lot of times you start off working for another company. So don't be discouraged if you don't have an idea right now that gets you to the billion dollars. You might have to start honing your, your craft as an employee for a company before you actually get there. Um, it would be great if we had, a, you know, we had somebody develop something at ANT immediately or from their senior design project and they went on to, I don't know, drop out of school like, 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 like Bill Gates or somebody and, um, and, and start and blow up. But it might not always work out that way. I just want to make sure I, 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 I submit, submit that home. Um, okay, here we go. Talking about funding for startups and crowdfunding and angel investors and everything else. Um, You've worked mostly with that way with getting with uh, securing funding, right, Carl? Yeah, I can. Uh, let me touch base on this this entrepreneurship and funding and, and things like that. Uh, so when I started in this space, I, again, I jumped back into the face recognition space, doing a lot of uh, work for the, for the U.S. government. Uh, I was not alone. There were many, many teams out there, teams from CMU, MIT, all, all over the place, as you can imagine. Um, and one by one, I, I, I saw these individuals just uh, sort of take their development that they did on the U.S. Uh, dollar, U.S. government dollar, and sell out to Facebook, Google, uh, just name your favorite company. And all these people that are leading up their computer vision and their face recognition, these were all my colleagues. 
So I said, hey, you know, I, I need to figure out how I can do the same thing. So in, in essence, uh, I bootstrapped the company or the technology through government contracts and grants. That's how I started. That's how I built up my technology. That's not going to work for every case, every person. But for me, when you're talking about high technology where you're developing something that is unique and novel and there's someone willing to sponsor that re research, uh, that is a potential vehicle for, for funding. When I, when I decided that I was going to spin this company out, I, uh, I basically uh, took some savings uh, and I took along with me from my research lab, my top students and top research associates. And I said, hey, we're going to go start a company. And oh, by the way, I need you to quit your job, which was working for me at the university. Mm -hmm. And I had to pay them, uh, you know, while they were uh, working on the outside. Great thing for those uh, government contracts, right? I, I could afford to pay them uh, and, and out of my pocket. And then we were able to, because we had this really cool, innovative idea, we were able to quickly land uh, some seed investment. And our seed investment was, was rather large. Uh, it was $3 million was our, our, our first investment. And uh, since 2015, we've, uh, uh, we've sort of raised about $9 million and we're constantly in the raising uh, cycle. So we're, we're looking to raise another uh, two and a half million. And you continue to raise money so that you can sort of build and scale your product so that you can grow revenues. Eventually, you want to stop raising money because you've grown enough revenues that you don't need to, you know, uh, support it through outside dollars. And that keeps your dilution low as well. Cool. Um, good. Thank you for that. Um, Dell, I'd like to say something about it. Oh, sure, please, go ahead. I think that, uh, you know, what Carl is saying and what I've said, uh, there's something that's is, that's, is kind of a, uh, either overlooked or it's a big secret or not well known, and that is that starting your company from, the, from being a government uh, employee. In other words, as an engineer in the government or a scientist in the government, Depending upon what you're doing and make sure you get in the right space. Uh, they do some great things in the government because the government has the most money and they, they you know, the defense, NASA, uh, these agencies, they have huge monies. And so it, for somebody who wants to take that path, it's a great path. And while you're there, you'll learn uh, in a few years. It doesn't take you a long time, but you'll learn how you can do this and how you can uh, actually launch yourself with actually very little money, uh, depending upon which direction you go into to, to get started. Yeah. I'd like to also say hi to uh, Dean Kogler. <laughs> she's going to give us... Hey, Jim. Great to see you. <laughs> she's she's going to she's gonna talk to the group in a minute. Um, Carol, we had another question. Good. I want to get a few more questions in before, uh, before we wrap, though, Dean Kogler, if you don't mind. Cool. All right. Um, go ahead, uh, Alex. So Donald McCoy, uh, good friends of the college. Hey, Donald, uh, wants to know for the year, for each of the panelists, uh, as an experienced business leader and STEM professional, what one or two things would you tell your younger, lesser and experienced self um, that you would have benefited from the most? I just want to add to that question, especially given um, the different parts of your career that you are currently in. Hmm. Cool. Um, think on that panelist for a second. Let that let that sit because um, that can go in a lot of directions. Yeah. I can uh, I can start if you want me to. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, well, the thing that that I could have benefited from the most was even knowing that it was even possible when I was in school that you could start a business. I was telling the uh, group the other day that. When I started the school uh, at, at AT&T, uh, I didn't know, there was no engineers, no black engineers that worked in North Carolina. And so a friend of mine and a fraternity brother was the first black person that got hired by Western Electric, got hired as an engineer. So it was just known that we had to leave uh, North Carolina to get a job in engineering. Uh, and so uh, I could have benefited more if I had 
been exposed to what you're being exposed to uh, right now, the whole idea that you can, uh, you know, have options as, uh, you know, being going into your own business. And that's why we're here, Mike, like I said at the beginning, a lot of times the difference between people that, are, that aren't, are entrepreneurs or not is the energy and the exposure. We are, we are trying to fill that exposure gap now. Uh, Carl, did you have something you wanted to say to answer that question? Yeah, uh, I would like to add, if I had to do this over and, and speak to my younger self, um, one of the things that I would, I would tell myself is uh, have belief. Have belief in, in your capabilities have belief uh, in your ability to, uh, to learn. I have a PhD, so you think uh, that, you know, with a PhD comes a certain amount of swagger or arrogance. But when you're going to kind of step out there on your own, um, there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of people looking at you. I mean, it, it's tough. I sit in, uh, you know, boardrooms uh, across the world, literally, uh, with uh, the C-suite. I'm the only minority in there. Uh, and I am shocked by how unimpressed I've been with these. Yeah. I had thought that these were brilliant people that in some kind of way, I'm a sham for sitting in there. And then you get that exposure and you're like, holy crap, I should have done this like 30 years ago. These guys don't have a clue. Let me tell you Aggies that you guys got it. What we learn at AAC, how they build us up, is something that you cannot get at another institution. Screw all these R1s. I compete against them every day. Yeah. You know, and I can tell you, we are good enough. He's not lying. He's not, he's not lying. I, <clears throat> I, we, we compete, I compete against the, you know, the same uh, named places and excel and, and win. Um, I'll add my two cents uh, as, a, as a bit of advice is, and it's really more about this energy, is it doesn't matter if you have the idea yet or if you know what the business is going to be yet. Think like you want to be an entrepreneur. Just having that mindset, that's why this is called the Mindset Series, just having that mindset is so when you think when, when the idea comes, you don't have to try to get that mindset. You already got that mindset. You don't know when the idea is going to come. You don't know when your expertise is going to find, a, find the opening, find a hole. But if you're already thinking like it and you already got that kind of energy, when the, when the time comes, you're ready. There's a lot of times people might come up and be like, oh, I had a good idea or, or I thought about that before they did. It, it, it doesn't matter. If you had the energy to make it happen, you wouldn't, it, it, it didn't happen and they did. So get that energy now. You might, the, the big idea might not come this year, might not come next year, but when it comes, you'll be ready. So that's why I'm all about the energy, the exposure and the energy. We're going, we're going to keep poking you all students. We're going to keep faculty too. We're going to change the whole energy of everything. Like, like, like Carl just said, he took his research and made a whole company out of it. So it's not limited to just students. It's faculty, everything. It's the energy of innovation, energy of making something happen. Cool. Um, Raheem, I know you are the youngest one on the panel. Yeah, yeah. Anything to your younger, yeah. younger self? <laughs> um, well, yeah, yeah. One thing I would say is that that you don't have to be you you don't have to be the best to start to start your business. I feel like early on I was focused on trying to be perfect and trying to you know get to this level of expertise before I could start my own business. And I feel like some time was wasted there, and I feel like even now I don't feel like I'm the best developer. But like how Daryl said, it's about having that that engineering mindset. I've worked side by side by developers who were great, but they couldn't have that, they didn't have that motivation and mindset to like take with, take their talent and start their own thing. So yeah. um, another thing I would say was um, don't quit your job. Uh, I feel like that I, I tried that before, before I moved to Atlanta, where I, you know, it was like, you know, everybody says, hey, you need to have the time to get my nine to five and quit my job and start my own business. Um, I tried doing that and I failed the first time. So I feel like that's kind of a misconception that you don't have to you know, quit your job to start your business. I feel like you can still have a job and do entrepreneurship. And once your business is making more than your job, then you, know, then you might wanna you know, look into quitting or hiring people. That's a good point because I wanna dispel this myth. There's so many people, well I didn't say so many people, but there's a lot of people that start companies based on ego, which is the absolute wrong reason. They want to say stuff like, I make my own hours. 
or nobody tells me what to do. I run, I make all the rules. I work for myself. And that's all just an ego driven farce because guess what? Whatever company you have, let's say you have a company and you, you sell breakfast bagels, but you're not a morning person. So you're going to open up your breakfast bagel shop at 5 PM and everybody gonna laugh at you, but you made your own hours. You or you always work for your customers. I don't care whether you're making Apple iPhones or you're making, I don't know, uh, you're selling a service. You always work for your customers. Even if you are the chair, the CEO, you answer to somebody, you answer to the board. So there is no concept of I make the rules, I make the hours, everybody, I, I do my own thing. You will do your own thing and you will not make any money. You're better off getting a job if you don't have a, a financially solvent business. So don't be fooled by the whole, I'm my own boss and I make my own hours. You are the, your customers are your boss and, your, and your, your hours of operation are when your customer wants to buy your product. So cool, thank you for that, Ryan. Um, we have any more questions, any other questions? We're kind of getting close. Um, we're gonna start wrapping up from, from here. Um, Dean Kogel, you're gonna be able to take this away, but um, I appreciate you all panelists. I appreciate all the questions that have come in. Um, thanks for staying with us. Everybody looks like everybody pretty much stayed on a call too. We will have more sessions. Again, we were thinking about in the next session is probably going to be focused more on IP rights and the administrivia of starting a company, um, like the paperwork and all of that kind of stuff, which is pretty simple. But we're going to talk through all of that the next time we have a session, whenever we do. We don't know when we're still trying to figure out the rhythms to this. But um, thank you again to the panelists and everybody asking any questions. Dean Koga, do you have anything you want to say? Oh, absolutely. First, I want to say thank you. Thank you to the panelists and the facilitator and the planners. And you have been amazing. And this particular series is near and dear to my heart. I always think it's important, as you said, Daryl, that the entrepreneurial mindset is something that you really need to walk with and you need to be ready for it. And when we heard Jim say he hated electromagnetism in school and now he became known and his whole business was based on it, it reminds us all that you really never know when you're going to need to use your content. So take the time to invest in yourself and learn your content while you're here because you then it allows you to pivot as needed when you actually go out and maybe start your own company. And as we were listening to you all and we were learning that, you know, Carl, as you talked about trade secrets and you didn't mean it this way, but it is true. When you're working at a company, there's certain things you've got to document. So you've got to think about what you have to document and what things are in your mind and do you have to give all your pearls when it has nothing to do with the job you're being paid for. And so, you know, when you said, Daryl, to make sure you're always ready, energy as well as thinking the right way, that means that there always should be something in the back of your head that you're holding to figure out, am I gonna take this a whole nother direction? And I listened to you, Raheem, and, Raheem, and, you, and you talked about how many different times you, you, you said, well, the first time it didn't work, but you even talked about your journey and how often you were, you were looking it up, trying to figure it out. And you've got to be curious and you've got to be willing to do the research and figure out what is the right direction for you so that you're willing to stick with it. And as you said, have the passion to do it. And so, because the passion is going to be hard work no matter what. And so if you're not willing to work hard for someone else and you're not willing to work hard for yourself, then we've got a problem. You, Working hard is just a fact of life, and it's so important that our, our excellence shows up, especially when you're working for yourself, because of the what habits you've already built. So this panel was sponsored, the series is sponsored by Intel, but the power of this was really the people who were involved. So thank you all, and thank you, audience, for taking the time to be here with all of us today. Yes. Excellent, excellent job, everyone. Cool. Thank you. Um, I'm a, I'm a, before we're going to end it right now in a second, but I want to make a challenge and I'm going to keep making this challenge after every one of these. Take your design, your senior design project seriously. Faculty, make sure people take it seriously. It's all about energy. You can get it for a grade or you can get it for a, a bigger thing later. So please take your senior design projects thing, uh, seriously. Um, okay, that's it. We're going to wrap. Thank you all for showing up and coming and sticking with us. Um, we'll, we'll keep you posted about the next session that we have. One more thing, if we can, we do have a link to a survey in oh. the chat. Oh. Yes. So if you are 
if you would graciously complete that, there are only a few questions. We want to know what your experience, how you uh, felt about your experience during this panel. So the uh, link is in the chat. Please feel free to go there and um, uh, submit your survey. Sorry about that. I forgot. You no worries. No worries. Thank you. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, all right, so we will keep you posted. We will have another session. There will be more sessions in the future. This is a long, enduring thing. and You will hear me challenge you about your senior design projects often. <laughs> Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Okay, Egolo. All right.